record this and we're yeah, going to post well, it on our YouTube channel. I'll be sure to share the link. But I'm so thrilled. This is um, my third program working hey, Sadie with, Beth. <laughs> with uh, Rachel. Am I echoing? Yeah. Well, that's odd. Um, okay, hopefully this is better. But uh, am I still echoing? No. No. Okay. Okay, so anyway, um, I've been building this relationship with Rachel Barnett and Jewish, his, you know, basically it first started when I found out about Kugels and Collards. We have this film group at Temple Beth Om. So for those of you who are not familiar, I'm the director of programming. My name is Leah Mandelbaum at Temple Beth Om in Los Angeles. And we've been connecting with Jewish communities all around the US, around the globe. Um, and basically we have a film group and we covered fried green tomatoes and Rachel and Lisa came on board and we discussed the film and they showed this beautiful fried green tomato that um, Lisa had cooked up. And I just so enjoyed their company and working with them, it's such a pleasure. And so we've sort of kept figuring out ways to continue to partner. Um, they then led a, for our sugar and spice and everything Shabbos group, it's a cook along group. Rachel cooked corn pudding, am I correct? And then um, okra gumbo, Lisa did, and here we are today. So, you know, I wanted to focus on this because we often think of the Jewish community, we think of everybody coming in through New York. Not a lot of people know how Charleston was such a significant port. And then there was sort of this, you know, tr coming into Charleston and sort of like a diaspora throughout the state in a sense. Um, and, um, Rachel has been working in the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, this Jewish merchant project, which she'll tell you more about. But um, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Rachel is the executive director of the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, and she's also, along with Lisa, the co-creator of Kugels and Collards. I'll put the link in there. It's such a great blog. Um, but uh, with that said, I'm going to stop talking and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Rachel. Great. Thank you, Leah. So uh, hello, everybody. We are so excited to be with you all this afternoon. And, and we too have enjoyed getting to know Leah and working on all of these programs together. Um, the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina has actually been around for 27 years. And we have a very long history. Uh, we have over 500 oral histories. Uh, we have a partnership with the College of Charleston and with the historic Jewish historic collection there. And um, we have done a lot of work over the years. We publish two magazines a year and we are housed at the college. But in 2016, we uh, decided we would begin a very ambitious project. And that was uh, to document, preserve and make accessible the history of all of South Carolina's Jewish merchants. Now we have been working on this. We've been writing about Jewish merchants. We had been meeting in towns around the state um, for those 27 years, but we didn't have a repository for all of that. So that was where we started in 2016. I will tell you that the website now has well over 200 merchants and every week we're adding more. So we have embraced the state of South Carolina and we will get into the small towns, but just tell you, that in South Carolina um, at the turn of the century and through the mid 1960s, early 70s, there was literally a, a Jewish merchant in every little town, Hamlet and Crossroads in South Carolina. So we have, um, that has been our goal is to document. Now everybody needs a great partner. And in 2014, Historic Columbia um, began a wonderful initiative and they launched the Columbia Jewish Heritage Initiative, which I was also on the committee for and worked with these incredible folks and the Historical Society was a part of that. So Historic Columbia was documenting all of Columbia's Jewish merchants. And then again, we came along in 2016 and began putting all of this together. So we have a great partnership going. Um, in Charleston, there has been a really terrific project there called Mapping Jewish Charleston. We'll put, get, send that link and that website to you as well, where they have documented all of Charleston stores and merchants as well. So this has been a, um, 
a statewide initiative, really. Um, Jewish Historical Society, we have the website, merchants.jhssc.org, but we have worked with Historic Columbia and with the college folks um, extensively. Um, just to mention what else Historic Columbia has done with their, the initiative here, online at their website, there is an online tour and there's also a walking tour that we have available for folks when they visit Columbia. And that's a walking tour of Jewish Columbia. So it, we've done a great deal in the documenting of our history here. So today I'm really pleased to introduce to you the Director of Research for Historic Columbia, Kat Allen. Kat and I have uh, worked on this project together since its beginning and she has thrown herself into it wholeheartedly. We have traveled the state to different locales and we have enjoyed that very much until the pandemic sort of put a stopped our travels, but hopefully in the next year, we'll be able to get on the road again. So Kat, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna introduce Stacy Levinson and Joel Lurie in a second, but just to add a little bit about what I do and what I'm gonna be speaking out about briefly today. Um, Historic Columbia was founded in 1961. We're a nonprofit preservation advocacy organization. So, you know, historically we were founded to save buildings, but our organization has expanded so far beyond that at this point, doing a lot of community history. And when I was brought on board in 2015, um, it was to manage this project, the Columbia Jewish Heritage Initiative. And um, like, like Rachel said, we have this really great walking tour and it's available online now because we're not really doing many tours during the pandemic. Um, but I'll be focusing today on talking about a little bit about Columbia specific history, but I'm so glad to have both Joel Lurie and Stacey Levinson, Levinson here to talk about their history with Jewish merchants. So they're both the grandchildren of small town merchants uh, who settled here in small towns in the early 20th centuries. And their grandmothers are Libby Levinson and Annie Lurie Simon. Uh, they were two of three sisters who ran clothing businesses in Barnwell and St. George uh, respectively while raising their families. Their sons moved to Columbia to begin businesses uh, here, and that was Britain's, uh, which was founded by Arnold Levinson, and Lurie's Department Store, which was founded by Saul and Mick Lurie. Um, this is, today we're going to be telling you the story about how some of our state's uh, Jewish merchants moved from small country towns like Barnwell to larger cities like Columbia, as told by this third generation. So Stacy Levinson is a third generation retailer and the owner of Britain's on Divine Street here in Columbia, South Carolina great place to get suits. Um, Britain's has been dressing the people of Columbia since 1947, but Stacy got her start at the store at the age of two with an unpaid gig singing and dancing, and she worked there throughout her childhood. In 1990, she moved back from New York City to rejoin the business, and in 1996 married Perry Lancaster, Lancaster, who started working at Britain's in 1975 at the age of 17. And today, Stacy and Perry continue that legacy that was begun by Libby and her husband, Charles Levinson, in the 1920s. So more than a century. Uh, Jewel Lurie uh, worked in, in Lurie's department store here in downtown Columbia on Main Street, which was established by his uncles, Saul and Mick, in college and off and on in the 2000s. Following in his father, Isidore Lurie's footsteps, Joel served in the state legislature for 18 years before retiring from the South Carolina Senate in 2016. He is currently president and CEO of Lori Life and Health in Columbia, and he also co-hosts uh, a new podcast called Bourbon in the Back Room with his former colleague, Vincent Shaheen. He's married to Becky Baum of Camden. Uh, together, they have two children, Rachel and Sam. I know we have a lot of Levinson and Lori family members on this call today, so I'm really excited about that. Um, but with that said, I'm going to pop over to a PowerPoint for about five to six minutes, and then we'll start the, the Q&A with Joel and Stacy. So let's hope this technology works. All right, here we go. All right, so we don't have time to show you the Jewish Merchants website. I do hope you'll check it out after this, but just, uh, just to show you that overview, this is the map, and this gives you, especially those of you that aren't from South Carolina, an overview of what our state looks like and where all of these merchants were. Many of you are familiar with Charleston down there on the coast and Columbia, which is in the Midlands or the center of the state. But as you can see, we have merchants across the state in small towns like Batesburg, Leesville, 
uh, middle-sized cities like Orangeburg, and then, you know, really, really small places like Andrews, South Carolina. You know, and as Rachel said, when I started this project, I'm not a native of South Carolina. I'm a, a Dallas native. And so driving around to these small towns and trying to figure out what's still there, if anything, if they even have a stoplight, and then documenting them has been um, quite a journey. You know, a lot of these places don't have the same archival materials that cities like Columbia and Charleston do, which means a lot of what we do relies on people like Joel and Stacy and other family members sharing their memories and unearthing all of these photographs that aren't currently in an archive. And so when you check out this website and you click through some of these site, these stories, just keep that in mind that it really, really wouldn't be possible um, without them. And there we go. And the three sisters that we're going to be talking about today, and Laura, oh, sorry. Annie, Minnie, and Libby, he, pictured here in 1955. So these are the three sisters. And again, for those of you outside of South Carolina, that top star up here is Columbia, but these stars down here are Barnwell, St. George, and Holly Hill, where L L Libby Levinson married uh, in 1927. Uh, these, these are kind of, these are where these were. This map is from 1921. So just to give you an idea of the lay of the land. And eventually these families would all end up here in Columbia, South Carolina. A little bit of long, long antebellum Jewish history. So Columbia was actually the second capital city for South Carolina. Um, it became the capital in 1786. And I love showing this map, it's from 1850, because it gives you a really clear idea of, of what our city has always been, which is a planned city. So it was founded on a grid. So all of the streets run at parallels. Every city block was the same exact size. Um, and you know, over the centuries, it's been slowly, slowly cut up into smaller and smaller parcels. You know, it's four years after the founding of Columbia, state constitution was passed that removed the religious test uh, for voting and holding office. And 1790 is also the first uh, state or the first US census. And it's also the first time that a Jewish man, uh, Jacob Cohen is uh, recorded as living in Columbia, South Carolina. By 1800, Charleston had become the unofficious Jewish capital with about 600 practicing Jews. But things are also happening in Colombia. So in 1822, we have the Hebrew Burial Society, which is established in Colombia. And four years later, we have the Hebrew Benevolent Society Cemetery established. And that cemetery is still here in downtown Colombia. It's kind of up near this corner where you see where the waterworks are. Um, and then in 1830, Colombia has the highest per capita population of Jews in the entire US. All right. I'm going to do a real close up look at early antebellum Jewish merchants. Um, you'll see here I have a handful of things labeled Columbia, South Carolina in 1850. Here is the South Carolina State House at the time, down here with the number one. Uh, this wooden state house burned in 1865. And today people think of the South Carolina State House as spanning both sides of what was then called Richardson Street. But in reality was is today known as Main Street. So when we talk about Main Street today, picture this Richardson Street extending upwards toward the 1600 block. The 1600 block is where Lori's department store eventually ended up. Britain's is actually in the 1300 block, which is right about here. And a couple of other things I want to point out are Mayor Henry Lyons' residence, which you'll see here is number three. I'll talk a little bit more about him in a second. His oyster saloon and grocery, which is right here, right across from the South Carolina State Capitol, and then also the city courthouse, which you'll see here, number five, um, which is about a quarter of a block. And then one thing I didn't put on here, but I really need to note, this far left corner, you'll see it does not have a property owner, but this was owned by the Hebrew Benevolent Society, and this is where their eventual meeting hall was. All right. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Alexander Marks, although I wonder if maybe Judge Gergel will talk a little bit more about him in the Q&A, but he was a really early merchant in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, he was a Charlestonian originally and moved here to establish what was known as the Marks Quarter and Relish House. Um, served oysters, it also had a really extensive reading room where uh, members could come and read newspapers from across the United States. But why he's important to Columbia and to South Carolina is that in 1833, um, he was fined and I believe jailed for opening his business on Sunday, which was the Christian Sabbath. And he fought this decision in court saying that his um, religious 
freedoms had been, his constitutional religious freedoms had been in, impinged upon because he did not celebrate the Christian Sabbath. Um, instead, he would close on Saturdays and therefore he needed to be open on Sundays to kind of make up for that lost time. And this, as you can see, the court case is still dragging on as late as 1842. Um, but basically the courts rule against him. I believe the South Carolina Supreme Court eventually dismisses um, his case and he ends up leaving the state. He moves to uh, Louisiana. And this is just kind of one instance in which while Jewish men and women are really accepted in Columbia, South Carolina, um, the Christian Sabbath was still the most important thing and was, um, you know, you know, yeah. So new Jewish grocery store, um, the Lyons family. So we've got Isaac Lyons Oyster Saloon, 1820s, 1830s. Uh, Jacob Lyons Grocery, 1843, 1865. And that's the advertisement that you'll see here. So Jacob Lyons is running the grocery store at that corner in front of the state house. And you'll see that he's selling all kinds of stuff. Um, just like Alexander Martz, he's selling uh, brandy gin, rum and whiskey, um, but he's also selling just kind of general stapled goods. Uh, Jacob Lyons' brother was Henry Lyons. And this kind of plays back into that Alexander Marks case. So Henry Lyons was the warden or basically the council, a council member for the Columbia City Council from 1842 to 1850. And, you know, part of the reason why he's running is kind of after what happens with that Alexander Marks court case and wanting to, you know, bring Jewish men back to prominence in Columbia, South Carolina. And then in 1850, he becomes mayor and he's actually the second Jewish mayor of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And here's this portrait um, on the left. This is from actually our collections. And then the final merchant I just want to mention is Lipman T. Levin. And this kind of shows the other side of antebellum um, Columbia, especially related to Jewish merchants that sometimes isn't talked about. So for as often as there were men like Alexander Marks and, and Jacob Lyons who were selling um, whiskey and, you know, staple goods, food, etc. There are also several men in Columbia who are auctioning off various goods. And among those are enslaved men and women. And this is one of many advertisements we'll see for Jacob and Lipman Levin, who were the kind of main downtown auctioneers and they are auctioning off people at the South Carolina State House. And I really just wanted to share this because I think it contrasts quite starkly with some of the civil rights stories that you're gonna be hearing um, from Joel and Stacy today. And then the final thing I'll mention, of course, you've just seen three portraits of men. And there are no portraits of women, but women were extremely important during the antebellum period. Um, you know, this is from the Occident and American Jewish Advocate out of Philadelphia. And it's noting the Hebrew Sunday School of Columbia, South Carolina, and its very first examination that takes place. And again, at this point, the, the Jewish hall has not been built yet. I think that's constructed a couple of years later. Um, but they are holding examinations for this Hebrew Sunday School, and it tells us a little bit about what Jewish education would have been like during the antebellum period. So you can see here they had between 20 and 30 children, the youngest of which was three years and the eldest of which was 10. But you'll also notice the women. Oh. Mrs. Boanna Wolf was actually Henry Lyon's sister-in-law, and she was the one who founded this Hebrew Sunday School when she arrived in Columbia following her sister after her marriage to Henry Lyons. The directress, Mrs. Cecilia Marks, this would be Alexander Marks' wife. Uh, Julia Mordecai, who was related to the very first mayor of Columbia, I believe. And then Miss Eliza Marks, who was also a relative of Alexander Marks. So what you're seeing is a very small insular community in Columbia, South Carolina during the antebellum period. But of course, the meeting hall that this congregation, which was known as, known as Shirith Israel, met at uh, was destroyed in 1865 when about one third of the city of Columbia burned. Um, many, by then, many antebellum Jewish families had, some of them had left the state like the Marx family um, for places like Louisiana. We have other family lines that just eventually die out. And then so we see an opening 1880s to 1900s is when we have a new uh, several new waves of Jewish immigrants that are coming from both Central Europe, including Switzerland and Germany, and then Eastern Europe. And they begin establishing themselves across the state. And the person in Colombia we see that is bridging this gap is a man named uh, Abraham Traeger, who was a Polish immigrant who arrived in Colombia about 1855. And so after that uh, Shirith Israel Hall burns in 1865, the Jewish congregation needs somewhere to meet. 
And they actually meet at his farm, which is in downtown Columbia on Lower Main Street for about 40 years. So Traeger lives to be more than 100 years old. And he provides for many decades a continuity between kind of the old guard of, of Jewish uh, families in Colombia and this newer generation that's arriving beginning mostly in the 1880s. Um, we have two congregations in Colombia. The first that was founded is the Tree of Life Congregation, which is a reform congregation um, with 18 members originally. And Abraham Traeger is among those. Philip Epstein, you know, the Levin family is still here. So this would be Lippmann Levin's son. And then you also have immigrants like Henry Steele and Barrett Vizanska, who are both jewelers in downtown Columbia and the Cone family, I believe from Orangeburg, who is still around. Um, and their first synagogue was finished in 1905. This is the only photograph I've ever seen of this building. It was demolished decades later. If anyone has another photograph, we'd, we'd love to see it. Um, and then a couple of years later, we have the Orthodox House of Peace Synagogue that's founded. And that first synagogue is completed in 1909. And I love sharing this photo in the top um, right hand corner because this is the only photograph of that very, very first synagogue that's completed and that, that you can still see. And it's this gabled, um, gabled rooftop that's right behind Kaba Rivkin. It's a really, really simple building but it only lasted about six years um, before it was destroyed by fire. And I will say that uh, the person who is credited with saving the Torah scrolls is Isidore Gurgel. Um, and he is honored with that, with a plaque at um, one of the Beth Shalom cemeteries. So we have, interestingly enough, Philip Epstein, who was the first president. And again, that's where you're seeing a kind of break in the Jewish community from reform with the Tree of Life to this smaller group that is coming over and founding the Orthodox uh, House of Peace Synagogue. And then again, the Rivkin family. And there are many others. These are just a couple that I wanted to mention. And then in 1915, the same year the first synagogue is destroyed, a new building is completed and it was finished within the year. And this building, for those of you that aren't in Columbia, uh, it actually still stands. It was moved and it's been restored several times. It later became um, an African-American music hall known as the Big Apple, where the Big Apple dance was created. Um, it was owned by our organization for a time, although now it's in private hands. Um, but we usually try to take people on tours uh, by there and sometimes inside there. And so with that said, I'll stop talking and we'll start talking about the Lorries and the Levinsons. So I'm gonna ask Stacy to start. But Stacy, do you wanna just give us a, a little bit of information about how the Freedman sisters uh, arrived in South Carolina uh, and when that was? Absolutely. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for having me. And I'd like to say hello to all the cousins out there. I wasn't really expecting such a family crowd. So if anybody contradicts my information, Aunt Margie gave me the information. <laughs> so please correct me if I'm wrong. But in 1916, our great grand, our great great grandfather, no, our great grandfather came from Poland and he came to Charleston because his wife, Bailey, had relatives that lived in Charleston. Yeah. They came in 1916 with two sons. I believe it was Richard Gurgle's yeah. grandfather. And um, their names were Sam and William. They owned a small grocery store. And according to Aunt Margie, they were very poor and they struggled. And he wasn't a business person he preferred to dive in than run his business. At that time, World War I broke out and back in Poland, his wife Bailey and their children struggled and it wasn't until 1919 that with help of relatives, they had enough money to come to America. And so Bailey with her three daughters, Annie being 18, Minnie and Libby being eight and one son journey to America. They were so poor that I don't know if y'all know this, but they smuggled Aunt Annie onto the ship. Um, they didn't have a ticket for her. And when the ticket master came around to prove of passengers to be on the ship, they hit Aunt Annie into the bathroom. And um, in 1919, they rejoined her husband and went to Charleston. Um, they did leave one handicapped child behind and um, because he had a child that was ill 
and they did perish in Treblinka, but in 1930, thank God, they were able to send one of their daughters at 16 years old to be with their family in South Carolina. I, let me, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, at the age of 14, um, so that is how the sisters got to Charleston. The, hello. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so Joel, uh, your grandmother was the first to marry, right? So she married um, her husband, Louis Laurie, in 1921, I believe. Yeah, and there's a great there's a great story about that. Um, Kat, so can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Yep. So, so um, my grandfather Lewis Lurie um, was was friends with um, I guess it was um, I think Sam Friedman. Is that right? I think he was friends with Sam Friedman, and he went to hear um, he went to hear he heard my grandmother sing. And um, he went to Charleston to hear her sing and, and was just enthralled with her, her performance. And he, he let his friend Sam know that he wanted to date the older sister. Well, Sam ultimately set him up with Aunt Minnie. So on his first date, he went out with the wrong sister. And um, ultimately he was, he was a gentleman. He, he, he went out and, and Minnie, and Bailey and my grandfather went out for dinner, but but ultimately he he got the sister he wanted, which was my grandmother, and um, they dated. And in a short period of time of probably six eight months, um, they were married. So um, so she was the first to get married, and he at the time was um, I think living in St. Matthews where he initially started, um, and then opened up. A, he had a couple of small retail stores throughout South Carolina. He was quite the business guy. So he opened. He had a store in um, Springfield, South Carolina, even it, all the way up here in Eastover, South Carolina. Um, and ultimately, he and my grandmother um, settled in St. George, South Carolina, around 1914. Do you have any stories about what St. George might have been like? And oh Lord, you can't grow up as a, a lurry child. I'm sure all of my cousins will be texting me uh, anytime now that are on, they're on this um, <laughs> on this Zoom call. But you can't grow up without appreciating the the, the connection uh, between St. George and the Lurry family. Um, the store opened. Um, my father and his brothers and sisters lived above the store. There was one other Jewish family in St. George. By the way, St. George is in Dorchester County. So if you were to go there today, um, coming from Columbia, you would take 26 to 95, and it's about five minutes off of 95, you know, a few miles after you get on 95 from 26. But St. George um, really was where all the Luries kind of learned the value of hard work and education. All the kids worked in the store, um, and my dad actually took me um, to the building where the store is now, and the the building still exists and they lived right above the store. You've got a good picture right here of the store. It was right down the street from Rexall Drug Store. Um, and in fact, um, I'll tell you a cute story about that Rexall Drug Store. Lurie's, when they came to Columbia, had the, the famous two for one sale. And I'm sure there's debate whether Lewis Lurie started this two for one sale or Charlie Levison started it. But we're not going to get into that today, but what I can tell you is that I was always told that the um, that the two for one sales, the idea came from when Rexall Drugs used to have a buy one get one free on toothbrushes, and so that's ultimately what started the two for one sale. Um, there's a great picture you have here, Cat, with my grandmother and her youngest child, um, who was my dad, Isidore Lurie. He was one of um, six. He was the youngest child. And there's so many great stories about St. George. Um, St. George was a very welcoming community um, to, to this family of, 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 of Jews that were living there. Um, all of my aunts and uncles either went to Savannah or Charleston to study for their bar or bat mitzvah. My father being the exception, he actually uh, went to Florida where his, his dad had ultimately moved um, 
for health reasons. And um, that's where he studied. But St. George was just a, a wonderful community where the ultimate, um, the slogan for the store became Lurie's Where Friends Meet. And it literally was the sort of the, the, the retail was, you know, they were sort of the, 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 the centerpiece of town. People would come by, grandma would extend credit to farmers and so that they could get their dry goods and clothes. And then when their harvest came in, they would pay off their bills. Um, Lurie's was the first store to ever extend um, credit to African-Americans. She had a very, very warm um, relationship with the African-American community in Dorchester County. Um, my dad used to talk a lot about, he never really, believe it or not, um, even in the time that he grew up, he really never felt like he saw much prejudice, um, either anti-Semitism or, or racism, really until he moved away from St. George. But uh, even today, our family um, still supports, there's something called the Lurie Family Theater. It's on Parlor Avenue, which is the main drag in St. George. It's, it's named for the late Senator J.D. Parlor. I'll tell you a quick story about him in a second and, and then I'll be quiet. But there's an old picture house that, that my father and his brother and sisters helped renovate and dedicated to their parents called the Lurie Family Theater. Quick story about Senator J.D. Parlor. Uh, J.D. Parlor and my grandfather, Louis Lurie, were very good friends. They were, they, they were trying to bring a, a new sense of, of progressive politics to Dorchester County and became very, very close. And my dad used to campaign for J.D. Parlor. That's where he really got interested in politics. Fast forward to 1960, J.D. Parlor is running for re-election against a sheriff by the name of Jessup. And it was literally like the Hatfields and McCoys in Dorchester County. You, you weren't staying in the middle of the road. You either, Robert, I see you smiling, but you were either for Sheriff Jessup or Senator Parlor. And it was a just incredible election. And a friend of mine that worked with me up at the state house, his family owned the newspaper. Um, and I think it was called the Dorchester Golden Record or the Dorchester Golden Eagle or something like that. Um, but anyway, he's got a copy of that November newspaper framed in his office. It was November 1960, the day after the election. And the front page, the A1 big massive story was Jessup Beach Parlor. And then on the bottom right hand, about as big as my hand, you can see a small headline that says Kennedy beats Nixon. That's how big that election was in 1960. Um, so anyway, that's a, just a, a quick snapshot because there's a lot to talk about, but we could talk St. George for hours, but it, it really is where all of my aunts and uncles and my dad really um, learned their faith, learned their work ethic, and, and just as importantly, learned the value of treating people with respect and the value of public education. Thank you, Joel. That was great. I'm, so Stacy, let's talk Barnwell. So your grandmother marries uh, Charles Levinson in 1927, I believe it was. Well, back, I got to back up just a little because Libby had to drop out of school at 14 because they were very poor. And she worked at a store called Herbert, but the, she only could get a job doing odds and ends and cleaning. But then a woman comes into the store, she was only 14 and she was a little zoptic. And nobody could sell her an outfit. And Libby looked at Mr. Herbert and said, can I try to sell her something? And not only did she buy the outfit, she bought a few other things. And Libby said, I'm good at this. I guess I was born to do this. And she um, never picked up a broom again because she did not like cleaning. She liked selling. But in 1926, um, she meets Charlie and she didn't want to talk to him because he had blonde hair and blue eyes and she didn't think that he was Jewish but he swooped her off her feet and they were married in 1926. Well they bought a store in Branchville, South Carolina and they were very poor and he had two thousand dollars because he was a veteran of World War I and that was his pension and they didn't make it. And they went to Georgia, they went to North Carolina. Libby was only 17 and she said, I miss my sisters. And they 
decided to go back to South Carolina and Charlie went to several towns. And when he went to Barnwell, he saw a black guy sleeping in the alley and nobody was bothering him. And he said, if they don't bother the black guy, they're not gonna bother the Jewish guy. And in 1932 with Arnold being four and Margie 10 months old, they moved to Barnwell. And it was the population, my Aunt Margie said, was about um, like a thousand people and it was very poor. But according to Aunt Margie, my grandfather was the first to give credit to both white and black people. And, <laughs> and when harvest came, they paid their bills, but they carried, they rented a store and they were so poor that they took empty boxes and they stacked the boxes and then they had the one shirt on top of the box. But in every week, the money that they collected, they either went to um, Savannah or Charleston or Augusta to buy more merchandise until they built up a stock. But they always, they bought their kosher foods from these towns. And they also on Sundays also visited with their sisters and I'm sure discussed business, but Judaism still was very important to my grandparents and their family was very important. And so in the meantime, in the thirties, my grandfather, he loved shooting pool and, and playing poker. So he quickly befriended all the members of the community in the 30s. And my grandmother loved selling. So it was a combination that the town embraced. And in the 30s, my grandfather was invited to join the Ku Klux Klan. And my grandmother was invited to join all the bridge clubs. But obviously, for reasons that we all know, they respectfully declined, but they still befriended the community. And um, this is a great story because, um, so, so they were doing business and Libby decided that she wanted more fashionable goods. And her and Aunt Annie got on the plane, Libby got on the train, I'm sorry, Libby was 29 and Aunt Annie was 39 and together they went on the train. Their husbands had to stay in the store. You know, somebody had to run the store and they got on the train and they got in off in New York to the Taft Hotel, which I'm sure all the Lurries know the Taft Hotel in New York City was where they stayed when they bought. And Libby and Annie went, got all dressed up in their hats and gloves because they were very stylish and went in the pursuit of fashionable merchandise and cloth. That's how, that was one of their big businesses. They sold um, cloth and patterns and sheets and towels. And that's how they had the supplies in the store that brought in the townspeople. Again, I could go on for hours about Barnwell as well. You know, it, it's, it's again, like I am too young to really remember Barnwell, but the stories that the town embraced them. Um, Barnwell was thriving to Joel's politician because they had a um, gang called the Barnwell, the Barnwell gang, Joel, the Barnwell ring. The Barnwell and they ring. were the Barnwell ring, sure. Yeah. And they were able to um, put a CCC camp in Barnwell. And my grandparents sold to like the workers of the, there was the first infrastructure of South Carolina, of the, the country, you know, building the, um, the parks and giving the unemployed um, jobs. So they were embraced in Barnwell and in the forties, I'm sure, I'm sure Joel can tell you about is the 40s with the war they had the merchandise because Libby said you can't sell from an empty well and so they stocked warehouses when they got enough money and in the 40s is when they had all the supplies when things were rationed to make a living so that was that again I'm sorry I'm rambling a little because we're very passionate about St. George and Barnwell so we get a little tongue-tied when we tell the stories because we have so many great 
family stories about our our family. So Stacy, Britain's was founded in Britain's and Columbia was founded in 1947. And we have the pictures here of the very first store. Why don't you tell us, you know, post-World War II, what were the, the marketing tactics um, that your father, Arnold Levinson, um, put on display? So my, my grandfather, Charlie, gave my dad for a wedding gift the store. And my dad was only 21. He didn't know what to do with that store and it didn't succeed. And it was not on Main Street at that point. But in 1952, they moved to they moved to Main Street and my dad formed the store of Britons, but he commissioned, he commissioned or bribed the cab drivers that drove the soldiers from Fort Jackson and he bribed them to bring the soldiers over to the store to buy a suit before they went home to see their families. And um, like on the weekends or when they had a little leave. So Britain's um, at that point was like an overnight success. They had men's clothes for a couple of years. And then in the late fifties got into the women's clothes. And I'm sure Joel would tell you the same story but downtown Main Street was hustling. They always had fashion forward merchandise like fashionable merchandise. And it was a little different but it's the same, my dad, he, you know, we continue what we built. So like my father ran the same store, like my grandparents ran the store. So it was about the customer. It was about the friendly environment and both Britons and Lurie's became very successful starting in the forties to current day. Right, Joel? Oh, there's no question about it. I mean, and I'm, I'm so, um, can, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm so um, proud of Stacy and Perry um, for continuing the great tradition. Our store, um, that building you're seeing in the, the bottom right hand corner of the page, that's the store that Lurie's moved to, um, I wanna say around 1960. It's the old Efort department store. And um, Lurie stayed there and ultimately closed um, in 2008 and sold that building to what is now Mass General Store. And that really was a, a, one of the major, when you look at the redevelopment of Main Street, because Stacy will tell you that Main Street was booming in the 80s, but then for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I think the most important reason is when the Interstate Banking Act took place and all the major banks that were headquartered in downtown Columbia moved to either Atlanta or Charlotte, they took with them thousands of employees and jobs and, and downtown Main Street became very um, isolated. It looked like a desert. Um, but anyway, uh, with a lot of great things that have happened since then, our family sold the building in 2008, and that's where Mass General Store is. And that theater you see right to the right of it, which is um, the old Fox Theater, the Lurie family actually owned that theater, owned that theater as well, and um, sold that building uh, through some historic tax credits and other to the Nickelodeon, which is a great downtown attraction. So. Um, we we're very honored that when the people that developed the Mass General Store, the top two floors, they have um, apartments now and they still call it the lofts at Lurie's. And if you go into the Mass General Store, you'll still see some of the original signage from Lurie's department store. And Joel, do you wanna just really quickly talk about um, your own family's experience um, with the African-American community in downtown Columbia? Yeah, I think, um, Ken, I, I appreciate that. Cause that's one thing that we, we're, we're so proud of. And my son, Sam is on this, this um, call today. And, and we were just talking about, you know how we came to be who we are. And it just becomes, it, it sort of passes on from generation to generation to generation. And, and that's something that, that my family, you know, my father and his siblings learned through their parents in St. George, but um, there's, a, there's a great story that's been told to me and it's written in the book and it's part of history. Bishop Fred James, who would go on to become one of the more prominent AME bishops in the AME church um, was actually um, Bill Clinton's, was, was a bishop in Arkansas when Bill Clinton was governor and they became very close friends. 
Fred James still lives in Columbia. He's pushing 100 years old now and um, still a dear friend of mine. Pre-pandemic, I'd always see him eating at a restaurant and I'd, I'd go up and take care of his bill without him, you know, just with us talking. And I'd, I'd tell whoever the cashier was, I want you to go Google this man because he's got, you know, he's got things named for him in Africa. But anyway, Bishop James was working at Allen University, one of the two historically black colleges in downtown Columbia, Allen and Benedict, and Marion Anderson, who was a very famous opera singer and was a real um, leader in the movement for um, equal rights for um, arts performers in the 50s and 60s. She was coming to perform at the Township Auditorium and Bishop James would call some of the different stores that would have tuxedos um, in an attempt to rent tuxedos. And, and um, Bishop James had this very distinguished, deep voice. And, you know, he would call and inquire about tuxedos and they would say, yeah, we've got tuxedos. And then when he would tell them it was for Allen University, they immediately said that they did not rent tuxedos to, um, to people of color. And there was a store by the name of Lurie's um, that had just moved to a certain part of Main Street. Um, and he called and spoke to my uncle Saul Lurie and, um, and Saul and, and, and Mick had both moved to Columbia. I can't remember if he spoke to Uncle Saul or Uncle Mick now that I think about it. But anyway, he called and they said, please come down. We've got new tuxedos. It'd be our pleasure to rent them to you. And that became, um, that was the beginning of a great relationship between Bishop James and my family. One that it was, was extended to me um, throughout my, my life and political career. And I'll fast forward can't because it it continues to tell the strength of the the relationship between the Lurie family and the African American community. Just today in the state newspaper, there's a great story. Cousin Richard Gurgle, you need to, to see this. And it talks about the election of three men in 1970: Thomas Felder, who is still alive, I.S. Levy Johnson, who is still alive, and a neighbor of mine and my mother's and um, Herbert Field and from Charleston. They were the first three African-Americans elected to the South Carolina House um, since Reconstruction. And my dad played such a pivotal role in their election. He would take um, IS and go door to door in the white neighborhoods of Shannon and, and Forest Acres. And my brothers and I can tell you, we remember plenty of calls where people would call our house and say disparaging things. But once those three gentlemen were elected, my dad, and Judge Alex Sanders, who were deskmates in the legislature, gave up being deskmates. So each one of them would sit, I think dad sat with Mr. Felder and Alex sat with IS to help officially welcome them to the General Assembly. So the relationship between the, the Lurie family and the, um, and the African-American community has been such a wonderful relationship of love and trust and support that goes back um, over 50 years now. Over really actually um, about 75 years. And I, I just want to add to that. Um, Historic Columbia interviewed Bishop um, James maybe 15 years ago, and he told that story the exact same way as well. So we have that recorded for posterity. And then also when you're thinking about the year in which Marion Anderson came to Columbia, it's 1949. It's right after the end of the all-white Democratic primary. Race relations are not great in Columbia or in South Carolina. And Lori's had only been open for about 18 months. And, you know, that loan of those tuxedos would have been, you know, well known, at least in the merchant community, but probably in downtown Columbia. So it was kind of a big risk that the family could have been seen as taking. And so I think it's really telling um, to your uncle's character that they did that. In yeah, fact, one more quick you know, story about Bishop James. Um, he would speak occasionally on Martin Luther King Day. And when my dad was alive, I would take take them and then we would a lot of times go meet for lunch afterwards. I used to host these little lunches for dad once he got sick and, and would invite some of his different friends there. But Bishop James was very close to Dr. Martin Luther King. And in fact, there's a speech that Dr. King gives where Bishop James introduces him and Bishop James brought the recording for dad not to listen to. And, and you hear Dr. King saying, I want to welcome my, I want to thank my friend, Fred James for that glorious introduction. And this is the same Fred James that told you that story, just to, to indicate the level of prominence that he has played through our country's history. No, oh, absolutely. All right, before we're gonna open up to questions and we're, I'll just say them as they come out, but um, do any of y'all have any last thoughts about your, your family's legacy or, or what the families are up to today? Stacey, I know Britain's is, 
is still in business? All I can tell you is that in, there's not a day I wake up that I can't hear my grandmother say, you can't sell from an empty well. And I hear my dad say, call a customer. You know, we're doing the exact same thing. And I'm very proud to do it, you know, because I feel like through our business today, the stories of Libby, the stories of Annie, we have lots of Columbia customers, South Carolinians. They tell such loving stories of our family and the struggles that we've overcome and to be who we are today. You know, so it's, it's a wonderful journey that we're having. Yeah, I would just second that, um, Stacey, I'm so glad you said that, and, and Britain's, and Lurie's while it was open, but I know Britain's, y'all have enjoyed the same relationship where you now sell clothes to the grandchildren of, 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 of grandparents that came and bought their first suit at Britain's or at Lurie's, and so. I just helped the lady yesterday who brought me her shirt from 1960, when she, she want, was. Did she want to return it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you know what? I would have taken it from 1960. Yeah. That was a, a special return policy. But she bought an outfit from me yesterday. You know, it was like yeah. awesome that we're on our fourth generation of customers and they still so lovingly, um, you know, we share their memories. You know, our memories are their memories, a lot of it. And it's a great journey. Yeah, it's it's a great relationship. And and um, I'm, again, so proud of what Stacy and Perry Thank have done. You, to continue that that means a lot to me. Okay, Kat. We got a couple of questions. I'm not sure. Let's see here. Um, so when was it, was it Charles Levinson that was invited to join the KKK? Was that? Yep. Just so, as were his buddies. It was really before the um, civil rights. It was in the 30s. So it was more like the society club to join. But his, his friends were the men of the leaders of Barnwell. You know, it was the sheriff and it was the, you know, politicians. So they just wanted him to be a part of it because they liked them. But I will tell you, speed it up, that in the late 50s, early 60s, they marched through the streets of Barnwell. And my grandfather was the only one out there with a bucket of water. And the sheriff came up to him and said, the town's not liking this. And my grandfather was like, nobody's telling me what to do. I'm going to serve the water. So again, with Joel, you know, I think that really, because somebody brought it up to me, like, what is our, how do, why do we talk about accepting the black community? So, but it was um, acceptance because they were different than the town and B, my grandparents really needed the money. You know, they sold they didn't discriminate. They wanted to have a successful business. And the black community was a part of Barnwell from the get go. So. And, and here in Columbia, you know, especially the, the early arrivals and the, around the turn of the 20th century, you know, I, I showed everyone that picture of the original House of Peace Synagogue on what, what's known today as Park Street, but was then Gate Street. And that, that area was, was quite poor, and it was definitely a mixture of both recent immigrants and the African-American community. I mean, literally steps from that synagogue was the home of Nathaniel J. Frederick, who was the only Black attorney for a long time in Columbia, South Carolina, um, who argued before the U.S. Supreme Court and was kind of the earliest NAACP affiliated attorney here in Columbia. So we're talking 19, late teens, early 20s, 30s. And they, so they were right next to each other. And the rabbi of that synagogue also lived on that street. And so, you know, African Americans are frequenting those businesses, like the Rifkin family business. Um, and so there definitely was much more interaction that was happening, at least with that um, particular generation of, of Jewish merchants in Columbia. And then you see those people begin to migrate towards Main Street. You know, they're moving from Park Street and Assembly Street uptown to Main Street and are still welcoming African-Americans in their in their businesses. You know, Kat, I would say, um, and I can probably speak more to the political stuff than the retail stuff, um, but, you know, just fast forward and I think the year was 1982 or 83, um, and my dad um, really helped elect the first African-American to the state Senate since Reconstruction. So, all of you in Columbia have been to Columbia are familiar with the ID Quincy Newman Freeway. Uh, Reverend Newman was a dear friend of my dad's, um, was very, um, was, was, was somebody that really could bring people together. 
and Reverend Newman was running against my dad's own accountant. And my mom and dad um, had a big a community event at their house in, in the Rock Ridge Forest Acres area and really um, was just so proud to help play such a pivotal role in, um, in electing him. He would be the first African-American to run for, re to ever win a seat in the state Senate since Reconstruction. So that relationship between the Lurie's and the Levinson's and the, and the African-American community um, goes back, as I mentioned, you know, um, 75 years or so and, and very proud that it's still very strong today. And I just got a quick question um, about the, the Jewish merchant who was advertising the, the auction of enslaved people in Columbia. So, so the Levins were really, really prominent um, Annabelle members of the community. His brother, the, the J in the J and LT Levin, was actually the, the president of the, um, the local congregation during the Annabelle period. And Lippmann was actually the census taker for downtown Columbia. So we see his name everywhere. But, um, but they, were, they were auctioneers, so they had a storefront on Main Street, but everyone who, everyone who sold slaves um, did, had those auctions at the courthouse. Um, and so in recent years, especially in the last two or three years, there have been talks about doing some type of historic marker about where that historic courthouse was, because that was where so many of these people were auctioned off. And again, for them, it was just another form of their business. They're also auctioning off horses and corn and other types of, of goods. Um, and they, of course, after the Civil War transitioned away from that, and they, they maintained an auction business through the late, late 19th century. Um, but again, this is a whole different um, generation of, of, of Jewish merchants, you know, that are from the antebellum period. And so I think it's just such a stark contrast of, of what we're seeing in the early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century, again, with these um, people who are coming over and looking for a better life from Central, but especially Eastern Europe. Hey, Kat, I just want to um, pay tribute real quick because I know this is really about Columbia, but I think what's remarkable about my grandmother and her sister Libby and her sister Minnie, so that Libby and Charlie would go on to make Britons, uh, or they basically, you know, were the parents of Arnold and Margie and Arnold would make Britons a great success. Of course, you know, we've talked about Lurie's, but many Kalinsky's, um, Minnie and Jake Kalinsky had a son, Morris Kalinsky. And they would open and for 60 or 70 years run Bob Ellis Shoe Store in Charleston, which was one of the premier shoe stores in the country during its heyday. So pretty remarkable that these three women come over to, um, to America in the, you know, the early 1900s and, and they, um, between them and their children have these three retail powerhouses that, that all last for over 50 years or if not more. No, I agree. Well, I think he has, excuse me, I think he has to include Richard Gurgle's father in there too. Oh, of course. I'm, I'm sure that um, my mother's coming over for dinner tonight and I'll get to hear about everybody I forgot. Okay? Yeah, okay. Let me go ahead and apologize for that right now. Yeah, next time we'll have to have Judge Gurgle on and talk about the, the generation, the, the Gurgles arriving in Columbia at the turn of the century and, and peddling and, and going on from that. So... Um, okay, I don't know if we have any other questions, but um, yeah, any last thoughts? No, thanks for having us. I Rachel? do have one question. I was talking yeah. to someone today about how in my generation, it was, you know, often encouraged Jewish people to become lawyers and doctors and accountants. And, and it sounds like back in that day, was it you know, more like you want to become merchants, you want to own your own store. Was that actually not, so that wasn't the case? So um, I know that my, I mean, just, I know that my father was in medical school, but he didn't like it <laughs> because my grandmother wanted him to be a part of a bigger Jewish community and really didn't want him to be a merchant. But again, like she said, at 14, we had it in our blood. So we're good at it. <laughs> So that's how, and I, I mean, I always wanted to do it since I was two years old, but, and my brothers and sisters are all retailers, but in Joel's family, there were so many doctors and lawyers, they wanted their children to have a better life. Don't you think, Joel? Yeah, there's a funny story, Leah, um, that when my dad, you know, my dad was real interested. He was president of the student body, first Jewish student body president at University of South Carolina. And when he graduated college, he really wanted to go to law school. 
And Uncle Saul and Uncle Mick said, no, 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 no. There, there are already two or three starving Jewish lawyers in Columbia. You'll never make it. And they opened up a shirt store, a shirt shop on Assembly Street, and they put my dad in charge of it. And in about three months, he ran that business into the ground, and they said, you will cost us less money by going to law school. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's funny how things evolve. But I, I too, with Stacey, I just want to thank everyone for their interest and um, great stories to be told. And the Lurie's and the Levinson's are only a small part of the great um, – stories of, of Jews reselling or selling into the South and, and becoming, you know, accepted into the community and, and playing in, in some capacity or another, a very prominent role. I have a question for Kat. Um, sure. Obviously, uh, this is the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, but I'm a, a transplant, a fairly long-standing one. I've been here 40 years, but Still, uh, my family ran a large, historic, well-known uh, mercantile in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, until not that long ago when they finally sold it out. And I'm wondering if, there, if we are part of any kind of a larger merchant project across the South or whether it's up to each state's Jewish historical society. So I'll throw that to Rachel. <laughs> Rachel? Um, there is, the, um, I think there's an American Jewish Histor Historical Society. Um, but as far as merchants go, I'm not sure what other states are doing. I know that in South Carolina, we embarked on this four years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to, to, Tennessee, there is a group out there. They could be working on merchants as well, um, particularly in Memphis area. There's been a lot of research done, obviously, on the Jewish community. So. I'd like to weigh in a little bit on this, too, because <laughs> South Carolina is unique in many ways. You know, it had a very strong um, immigration refugee policy. It was a huge... Um, slave trade uh, destination in its day. And it's a relatively small state. Um, to, in answer to some of your question, you know, I'm not sure every state has a Jewish historical society, but we certainly do. This actually was started by Joel Lurie's dad, Isidore Lurie, about almost 27 years ago. And it was his wisdom, uh, knowing the rich heritage that Jews played in the South, that he felt like we needed to keep this perpetuating. We need to write the stories down. We need to document the stories. And that's precisely what we're doing. There is a Southern Jewish Historical Society, which is more of a regional one. And they might be one that you could inquire about specifically. But I think it was, it was really unique to South Carolina that it, it was not such a huge state that it would be difficult to document. It was a state that had, uh, in its early years, many, many Jews. In fact, I think as Kat noted, um, South uh, Columbia was noted as one of the premier Jewish destinations. And, and Charleston also was noted uh, at, during the time of immigration of uh, housing the most Jews in the entire uh, states as they were at that time. So I think this is unique. Um, but I can't tell you that other states are not doing it, but it would be something you'd have to investigate or maybe contact the Southern um, Historical Society, Southern Jewish Historical Society. They may have some information on that. Lily, I'll just add to that real quick. Um, you, you mentioned the, the uh, and Kat, you talked about the prominent role Columbia played in, in, in with Jewish community. There was a period of 12 years from 1972 to 1984, where Richland County, where Columbia sits, had four state senators, two of them who were Jewish, my father and the um, uh, of blessed memory, and also the late Hyman Rubin of blessed memory. So, um, you know, when certainly um, you mentioned dad's role, Lily, but also, um, and you know, that Richard Gurgle really partnered with my dad and, and helped really give this whole idea some legs and then they, you know, worked with Judge Sanders to create the College of Jewish Studies in Charleston, 
and um, it's just so nice to see how it just continues um, um, just to live and, and, and grow even today. So thank you again for having us on. Um, can I just, first of all, that was, um, just so everybody knows, that was Lily Filler who spoke before Joel and she is president of the Jewish Historical Society. So thank you, Lily, for your comments very, very much. And second, I wanna also recognize Robert Rosen and Judge Richard Gargle that are on the call. Uh, some of you have probably joined us on our monthly conversations program that Richard and Robert have been doing so successfully. Our next program is Sunday, March 7th, and it will be on the topic of the merchants of South Carolina. And we will take a much broader view. We um, this, Today has been about Columbia and specifically the Levinson and Lurie families. And in March, we will um, dial that out and look at the state as well as um, talk a little bit about Aiken, South Carolina, which um, had incredibly for a small town, more than 30 merchants. Um, most of their main street were Jewish merchants at one time and they're celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. So um, I just wanted to share that if you're interested in joining us in March, you can go to our website and the link to register for that program is at the jhssc.org website. And we, um, we really thank you, Leah, for inviting us on today and being able to share so, a little bit about South Carolina and particularly Columbia's Jewish merchant story. Thank you so much, Rachel, as always, and to Kat. It has been such a pleasure to work with you. And thank you to Joel and to Stacy. This was such a great program, and I look forward to further collaborating. To the Beth Am community, please do keep checking out the Jewish Historical Society and, and all the programs Rachel's doing. They have excellent work. Um, but I also want to put it out there uh, for anyone on this call who's interested in joining some of our um, travel programs. Our next one, uh, and feel free to shoot me your email right now, but it's uh, March 10th at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, um, but it's Immigration, Music, and Myths of Jewish Ireland. Uh, we'll be hearing from doc Dr. Natalie Wynn from um, tr uh, Trinity College in Dublin, focusing on um, arrival myths and Jewish arrival and settlement and the development of the community and Jewish identity. And then we'll also be uh, learning about Cork, Ireland as well. And she's going to be doing some, playing some traditional Irish and klezmer music live. So it should be a great presentation. All of you are welcome to join in that as well. Uh, with that said, thank you again for this great presentation as always. And uh, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Thank Thanks to all of you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you all. It was terrific. Kat, I'll be in touch with you. Oh, yeah. Yes, please do. Our guys are possibly relatives of ours. Okay, not... yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I do Mordecai. Um, and then I popped a couple of links in here with Libby Levinson, a great interview, and then also Hyman Rubin. Um, not one with Joel, uh, not one with uh, Isidore Lurie, but there is some really good biographical information. His papers are at um, the University of South Carolina Political Collections. So mm -hmm. copy and paste all those links if y'all want to hear more. All right. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.